again. But you all know of Neil Shubin and his book, Your Inner Fish, his work on TikTok, and some of his work will be described today in his seminar, Major Transitions in Evolution, Fossils, Genes, and Embryos. Neil. Thank you. Um, you know, in reading the origin of species, on the origin of species, Darwin's book, uh, it's hard not to be struck by how much diverse lines of evidence are pulled together to support the notions of common descent, descent with modification, uh, and natural selection. You know, facts of natural history, plant and animal breeding, uh, paleontology, uh, embryology, comparative anatomy, and so on, all are unified in a wonderful framework. But what's important about that framework is these different lines of evidence reinforce each other. They make sense of each other in a very meaningful way. They were formerly independent. Now they are linked in an understanding by our understanding of, of common descent and, uh, and uh, natural selection. And that's really been a theme of our field for you know, the last 150 years is, is a synthesis of one kind or another. Every a celebration of Darwin has its own synthesis. And uh, the syntheses that we're doing dealing with today are increasing at a rapid rate. We're including whole new kinds of data that we couldn't have dreamed about uh, uh, as much as 10 years ago. Um, and so that's really the theme of my, my talk today. Really, how do we pull together different lines of evidence to understand major transitions uh, in the history of life? And what I am focusing on really is starting with expeditionary paleontology. That is looking at the fossil record as a predictable discovery tool where we can begin to assess and understand key moments in the history of life on Earth that we can make discoveries that, you know, that help us think about major transitions. But importantly, not only do they answer old questions, but they also provide us the ability to ask new and more profound questions. Uh, and that's really what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, be being able to ask better and better questions with each new solution. And really what I'm dealing with here is the interplay between developmental genetics and, uh, and, uh, and expeditionary paleontology, and that they reinforce and illuminate reciprocally uh, one another. And they do so because of the power of the tree of life and descent with modification. That was a mouthful, sorry. Anyway, so um, we will begin um, with, you know, this is really what we're going to be looking at today is the origin of limbs, the transition from fins to limbs, the evolution of appendages. That's really been a topic I've been working on for the last 20 years. And what's interesting here is if you look at extant appendages, take the, uh, take the forelimb uh, of a human or a chicken uh, or the fin of a lungfish or, or a paddlefish, they look utterly different. It really is hard to make comparisons uh, uh, among them or between these two kinds of things. These have fin rays and many bones, and these have a characteristic pattern of bones, one bone, two bones, little bones, uh, and then uh, the digits. And this calls for really suggests the importance of fossils in all of this, because as we add extinct taxa, we begin to see, and this is just a fraction of them, we begin to see forms that have both fin rays and that one aspects of that one bone, two bone, further other bones uh, pattern. And it's really these extinct fossil taxa from about 360 to 390 million years ago that tell us quite a bit about the intermediate stages in the uh, evolution of vertebrate uh, limbs. And I can actually blow this up for any of these other transformations here, and you can see sort of intermediate stages among many of these different, uh, different appendages. But this suggests a very important and powerful role for paleontology. That is, what we can do to begin to answer these questions is to have expeditions that are targeted to key parts of the, of the tree of life. And it's not random. We can actually use the fossil record, an understanding of phylogeny, an understanding of stratigraphy to predict likely places to answer uh, our question. I'll give you an example uh, of that today. But finding those fossils isn't the end point. It's the beginning. And it's the beginning of a powerful new way of asking questions, because oftentimes seeing these intermediate morphologies as recovered from the fossil record give me a new way to think about the developmental biology of extant taxa at the key points of the cladogram. That is, my understanding of fossils gives me new questions and new experiments to think about on extant taxa. And I'll give you an example of that. And then it's reciprocal. That is, my understanding of development and genetics gives me a new way of thinking about morphologies that I might have thought I understood before, and oftentimes suggest new areas or new problems to look at in the fossil record using our targeted expeditionary paleontology approach. All right, let's just deal with some examples here. I'll just run right through it, that, that reciprocal illumination. 
For me, it all began in Pennsylvania. I was born in Pennsylvania, but also I began my hunt for uh, development for uh, Devonian fishes uh, in Pennsylvania. My first academic job was in Philadelphia. And what you see here is Pennsylvania is sort of festooned with, uh, with Devonian age uh, sediments. And they're of the upper Devonian age. And <clears throat> if you want to think about Pennsylvania 365 million years ago, get Par uh, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, and Philadelphia out of your brain and think Amazon Delta. Because what you had was an highlands to the east, an inland sea to the west, and a series of rivers draining from east to west. Now, if you're a paleontologist interested in finding fossils telling you about the transition from life on water, life in water to life on land, this is perfect because you can sample uh, the ancient oceans, estuaries, all the way upstream, uh, if you will. Pennsylvania had a problem in that it has very poor exposures for us to work on. Uh, Pennsylvania is not a, uh, not a desert. So my research with uh, Ted Deschler, who was a graduate student at the time, and since a long-term colleague, has been to follow the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation around as, uh, as they put in new roads. So as they widen roads and put in new roads, what they do is expose cliff faces. This is awfully dark here. But what you um, have is a series of strata here, uh, ancient streams, uh, oxbows, meandering streams, and so forth, which produce fossils. And starting in 1990, we began picking the fossils out of there. And it was a really rich uh, place to look because we found uh, some of the earliest forests, uh, this uh, tree, Archaeopteris, uh, numerous uh, different kinds of fish, including these long, 16-foot-long fish, armored fish, and early tetrapods. But there was one fossil that really changed my thinking and got me to think about new expeditions and so forth, and that was this one, which we discovered about uh, one, uh, uh, one hour north of State College, Pennsylvania. It's a fin, an isolated fin. It uh, has a shoulder girdle. It's clearly a fin because it has these fin rays right here. But inside these fin rays are the endochondral bones. These are the bones that compare to, the, uh, to our own appendages. And it has a one bone, two bone uh, uh, pattern. And in fact, if you compare it to what we knew about ichthyostegia at the time, and I'm just doing this to force a, a comparison. This is actually a hind fin, a hind limb of ichthyostegia. This is a forelimb of a seripterus. But you get to see that the pattern is approaching that of a tetrapod limb in a key way. One bone, two bones, two bones. Here you have one bone, two bones, two bones. And then you have rods that face away. Here they are flat and, and splay out in this bifurcate pattern. And here are the digits. Uh, but regardless, something about the pattern's the same. And it was really seeing those stunning similarities that got me thinking, boy, we really don't know a whole lot. And it's really time for us to think about looking at the fossil record in a, in a, in a different way, actually going back uh, in time. Because when you map this on a cladogram, this is what we kind of knew at the time. We had a creature known as Acanthostega with an early uh, appendage, uh, a limb with digits. Uh, you have uh, uh, lobe fin fish down here. This is the one I just showed you, Seripterus. But we really didn't know much about the limbs or even whole bodies of many of the, uh, of the sister groups uh, of tetrapods. So to find the sister groups of tetrapods, really what we did is narrow the search to a critical window, uh, both in space and in, uh, in time. And for a variety of reasons I'll go into later, uh, we ended up working in the Canadian Arctic. This is where we, uh, our, our playground. Uh, we're about 600 miles south of the North Pole. This is Ellesmere Island here. Zoom into Ellesmere Island. This gives you an extent of the sort of vast exposures of Devonian age rocks. They were the absolute right age for us to find a sister group for, uh, for tetrapods right here in this zone, the, the Fromm Formation. We've also actually now taken it lower in time. Um, it's very hard to work there. As you can imagine, it's very remote. So we spend a lot of our time actually trying to figure out how to work there and get home safely. Uh, we get around in uh, these airplanes, uh, bush planes, which actually land on the tundra, and uh, helicopters. Uh, so it's, uh, the logistics are difficult, meaning it's taken us a number of years uh, to, to be successful. And it's, it's kind of like the kids with the cookie. It took me uh, six years to be successful with my cookie. Um, we started off in 19, uh, uh, 1999 in the western part of the Arctic. And this is what camp looked like. And it's a little dark, but the, we, these are the rocks we would work on. They're very flat. 1999 was remarkable for one thing. We didn't find anything of importance that year. And uh, the reason for that was we were in pretty much marine rocks. So back to the drawing board, we went to the geological reconstruction, which was very similar to Pennsylvania, where we had an inland sea to the west and a series of rivers draining, draining from east to west. The idea was to go upstream in the ancient environment, which in this case meant going east. And that we did in uh, 2000 going to this uh, eastern part of uh, and the southern part of southern Ellesmere Island. And as soon as we did that, we started to find lobefin fish. 
Uh, not the kind of ones we were looking for, but lobefin fish of a variety of types. Took about another year uh, for us to find this site. Uh, this, is not, this is the site the day it was discovered, uh, before it was discovered. And what you see here is, I don't know if you can see it in this darkness, but here is, you see sort of a green layer there? That's a green layer because it's a carpet of uh, fragments of bone right here. I mean, literally thousands upon thousands and thousands of fragments of bone that were weathering out of the rock. And it was found by our youngest field member, a, uh, a college undergraduate. Anyway, so what we did was, this is us at 3 in the morning working that site the day he, he discovered the lair. We exposed the lair as a uh, giant hole in the ground. Well, it looks like a giant black hole in the ground. Um, and uh, over a period of time, worked those layers. And it took about another year until Steve Gatesy, a colleague of mine from Brown, was picking at the rocks and found this. And I don't know if you could see it, but here's rock. And you can see this little V-shaped thing here. As soon as we saw that, we knew we, we uh, found what we were looking for, uh, a flat-headed fish. Um, and as soon as we pulled that out, uh, we found more of these flat-headed fish. About four we found uh, that season, and subsequently uh, about individ 20 individuals, fragments and bits and pieces. They come home on the bottom of a helicopter encased in plaster. And when they come home to the lab, the you know, it's, uh, the plaster's opened up and the preparators begin to etch away at it. Um, and here you see after about a month of picking away at Steve's specimen, the preparator um, prepared at the top of this thing. It looks like a skull. There's one orbit here. There's one orbit here. This is uh, in the fall of 2005. About four months later, uh, this was what was exposed. You see we have a flat-headed fish with one, eye, one orbit there, one orbit there. Looks like we have a, a shoulder girdle and indeed a neck where the head is separate from the shoulder girdle. And just to give you a sense, after about eight months of this preparation, you know, here's the fish, here's a tetrapod, um, here's the new fish. And the idea is, is it's a tiktaalik, um, that it has uh, scales and fins with fin webbing, but like a tetrapod, it has a flat head with eyes on top, uh, a neck, a mobile neck, and then, a, and then aspects of a tetrapod limb with elements of the shoulder, uh, elbow, even parts of the proximal and distal carpus. Now, um, tiktaalik, I, I, when I was listening to uh, Eric Lander talk yesterday, he was telling about the, the, the amount of data that, is, is, that genomics is generating. And it was truly really daunting to see what he was, uh, he was doing, with the amount of data that's coming out every day, every month, every year. And I was excited, and then I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, because I realized uh, I've spent six years collecting one data point. <laughs> um, but the difference is I could actually um, carry my data point around and this is a cast of Tiktaalik here. And I brought it for, so during the break you can, uh, you can look at it. But one thing about something like this is it's an object. It's a physical object. And just to do a, a, a minor slight digression, is that the object, the physical object, has a power to it. And it's revealed to me when I visit um, schools. I do a lot of elementary school talks. And it's almost invariable when I'm dealing with kids between, say, six and nine. Uh, that they look at the thing and they, to watch them interact with it, you know, I ask them, I put it down in front of them and I say, what is it? You know, it's invariable one kid says it's a fish because it has scales and, and, and fins. And then it's almost invariable that another kid says, no, 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 it's a crocodile because it has a flat head and because it has this crocodile-like head. And then they look at it for a while and usually one or more say, well, you know, God, maybe it's both. And, you know, that's my entree. They say, well, kids, maybe there's evolution, you know, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> But it really is the power of a physical object, is, uh, and that's why museums are so rich. Anyway, over a period of time, uh, we collected a number of these, uh, number of these skeletons and <coughs> began to prepare out the fin. And here's a humerus that was prepared out. It took about a year and a half to prepare out the fins, um, but that we did. Here's the pattern of the bones when you remove uh, the fin webbing. And then when you crack open the bones, what you see are uh, the uh, shoulder, the elbow, and proximal and distal carpus of the proto-wrist, if you will. I mean, we can actually see the articular surfaces of these things and to begin to assess how this thing functioned. Well, that's great and that's wonderful, but that's not where we're going today. Where we're going today is the questions and new and powerful questions this gives us a chance to, uh, to ask and hopefully answer. That is, we now know this about uh, the, uh, the fins. We can now ask the question, what does this tell us about extant fins? And what experiments does this suggest to us in developmental genetics? So now we're going to go from the expeditions that are targeted to key parts of the life, the tree of life, finding Tiktaalik and others, uh, and now looking at the developmental genetics of non-model organisms. And what do I mean here? 
Well, let's just look a little bit at what a, you know, a tetrapod limb is. It has three components, broadly speaking. One bone, two bones, and then the, so the wrist bones and the, and the fingers. If you look at these in the development, as many have, Zanita Buhl, Cliff Tabin, uh, and others, uh, what we see are two broad phases of Hox gene activity that are associated with the pattern specification of these components of the appendage. So there's this Hox phase one expression where you have these nested patterns of expression of different uh, paralogs of, of the Hox D and A uh, cluster genes. And then when they, and, and then when you misexpress or uh, you uh, knock out these genes in Hox phase one, what you do is preferentially affect this stem of one bone, uh, two bone area. Then when the uh, wrist, specifying the wrist and the finger bones, there's another phase of Hox gene expression that comes on. It's presumably independently regulated. And this is called Hox phase two, which consists of a distal phase of expression. When this is manipulated, it preferentially affects the wrist bones uh, and the digits. And the theory at the time that was proposed by Tabin, Dubul, others, including myself, uh, was that really the origin of appendages, uh, vertebrate limbs, is, is associated with the origin of Hox phase two expression. Now, when you look at the fossils here, you know that that can't necessarily be right. And in fact, it suggests something to look at. That is, what you see here is there's one bone, two bones. I'm just looking at Tiktaalik here. And you have a whole bunch of stuff in a distal or third compartment. The question to ask is, are there elements of this phase two already established in fins uh, uh, that enable that distal portion to develop? And so what we decided to do was look at an extant uh, ray fin fish uh, sort of because of its position in the cladogram and also its, its, uh, its, its morphological structure, um, and uh, to see what the, whether it has Hox phase two. And this is polydon. This is a caviar fish, you know, like a sturgeon. Uh, we don't eat our lab animals. We let them develop. Uh, but here's a, a, a grown-up polydon. This is its fin. And the idea is, you know, is there a Hox phase two expression here? Marcus Davis in the lab a few years back worked on this. And you could see uh, in early development what you have is a classically nested pattern of expression of Hox, uh, Hox phase one. And then coming on later in development, uh, when the fin is much larger, is another distal phase uh, of expression. It's not identical to tetrapod limbs, but it's definitely there in every, uh, in every case we look at. So the idea, the idea here is then knowing something about these really gave us a sense to, to think about these creatures, the extant creatures, in a new way, and basically showing that elements of that developmental program that build uh, fingers and toes are probably present already in, in fins. The question is, we really don't know exactly what it's doing. We haven't done functional studies of this, nor do we know if it's independently regulated or not. So there's still a lot of questions, but it's there. It definitely is. But then what leads to the question is really, what is a limb? And how did it develop and evolve? Um, and this is just a sort of taken from Scott Gilbert's developmental biology textbook. Um, limbs are characterized by having two signaling centers, one called the AER and the other called the ZPA. There are a number of factors that are active in the, um, in the limbs, which I'm not showing you. Uh, and indeed, the, there are a number of factors that, uh, that have numerous feedback loops between the ZPA and, and AER. Just to give you a sense of what these are, let me show you the AER. The AER is a thickened ridge of tissue in the seat in here in this SCM uh, that sits at the distal end of the, of the limb. Here you see a section of it. It's a pseudostratified epithelium. And it expresses a number of factors, most notably this factor FGF8. What's interesting about the AER is that if you cut it off at different stages of development, you get stage-specific truncations. That is, you cut it off early, you get a you know, stump of a humerus, come it off later, and later and later you get more and more, um, more, and more uh, limb developing. So it's clearly permissive uh, to limb development. The ZPA um, is a patch of tissue on the posterior side of the limb. Uh, it expresses uh, a factor known as sonic hedgehog. If you misexpress sonic hedgehog or uh, graft a patch of the ZPA to the opposite side of the limb, what you can do is get a mirror image duplication, as you see here in this, in this chick wing. And there are a number of ways to do that. One way is actually to treat it with retinoic acid, beads. Another way is to, I mean, there are, there are many ways to do it. The question they ask really is, how ancient are these signaling systems and the links between them? Are they characteristics of all appendages or just uh, just limbs. What we decided to do was then to look at the most uh, basal of the uh, paired uh, animals with paired appendages on the cladogram, that is uh, chondrichthians. 
And so the idea being that does the shared, does the common ancestor of all jawed fish uh, have these signaling systems? And so we looked at sharks, sharks, skates, uh, and rays. And this was work done by Randy Don in my lab. So here's uh, what the AER in uh, limb looks like. With skate fins, we found the same thing. We found it has a, it has a you know, thickened uh, ridge of pseudostratified epithelium, and it has expression of FGF8. And when you manipulate it, you get limb-like effects. Does, do these things have a ZPA? This is what a chick limb looks like. There's the expression of sonic hedgehog. When you take a shark, a skate, or a ray, what you see is, similarly, you see a posterior patch of sonic hedgehog expression. What happens when you mis-express sonic hedgehog? Do you get a, a limb-like pattern? Well, what we did is we, we get these eggs of these things, and we can inject them with a retinoic acid, which causes a, a number of effects. And what we did was we injected them with a retinoic acid, as well as a number of other experiments. And here's the wild type. You see there's a posterior zone of expression here. And uh, you actually upregulate sonic on the, on the anterior side of the limb, as well as all the way along here, which is slightly different uh, from limbs. But what's interesting is the morphological readout of this is that this is the untreated fin. And when you treat it with, uh, when you misexpress sonic, either by retinoic acid or uh, on other means with beads and so forth, you get a mirror image duplication, just like a chicken. So the idea here is, and there's other evidence here showing linkages between the AER and uh, the, uh, the ZPA, which I'm not showing you, um, that really shows that this appendage patterning system uh, with ZPA, AER, and all these other things uh, really is very general to all vertebrate appendages, not just limbs. Which takes us to a much deeper question, which really is, how did vertebrate appendages arise? How did that whole signaling system come about? And what could that possibly tell us about the fossil record? The first question we really asked in this is, how do fins differ from other outgrowths uh, in their development? And again, looking at you know, the, whether it has a ZPA and AER in different parts of the body. So we looked at sharks as an extinct one. But you know, if you look at a, uh, a shark or a skate, what you see is there are many areas that may be little outgrowths that could develop like uh, like a limb. Most notable of these is in the gill skeleton itself. And this is with, has some historical uh, resonance. What you see here is a shark head in lateral view. This is the head, and this is the uh, gill arch skeleton. If you look at this, it's cleared and stained. What you'll see is they're projecting off of each gill bar are these rays. And if you dissect them out, as Andrew Gillis, who was a graduate student in my lab, did, um, what you see is, this is the gill, uh, the gill bars here, these here, and each ray sticks off the gill bar. The idea is that perhaps this little gill area here is like its own little fin. That is, these rays grow out in a fold of tissue, okay, extending from this, uh, these, these bars. And this actually has some historical resonance in that a great anatomist, a comparative anatomist, Carl Gegenbauer, originally uh, looked at these and compared them, actually, to, to fins and limbs. So the idea was to look for AER and ZPA uh, in these things. Well, you remember that AER is this patch of tissue, uh, it's a strip of tissue in the distal region of the limb that has um, uh, FGF8 expression. Uh, we see it expressed in the, uh, in the skate uh, fin. And surprisingly, in the arch, these are very dark in this, in this projecting dark, but uh, what you have is a strip of of uh, FGF8 expression here, and it, when you do a section, it has a pseudostratified epithelium and behaves very much like an AER uh, experimentally. If we look at these gill areas and we ask the question, does it have a ZPA-like area? Well, in the ZPA, you have uh, a posterior zone of sonic hedgehog expression. Um, when we look at the uh, skate arches, what do we see? This is a ventral view of it. Here's the fin. There's the, the expression in the um, in the fins, but in each arch, in the posterior portion of the arch, you have a strip of sonic hedgehog uh, expression and the receptor um, patch, which is there. Um, does it behave like a limb when we misexpress sonic and in a variety of ways? And the answer is yes. What we do is we, you could treat it with retinoic acid or insert beads or what have you. In a chicken limb, remember, when you treat them with retinoic acid, you get a misexpression of sonic on the opposite side and it results in a duplication of the limb. Well, in these arches, um, you, uh, great, you, uh, you get um, uh, you have normal expression, then you actually get a, you can see it here, there's a duplicated expression uh, in, in, in that arch. 
Uh, you remember it produced a, a, a duplication in the appendage. What happens in the arch? Um, uh, you get a duplication. And this is the wild, wild type, normal one. It's simply a bar that bends anteriorly. In the treated specimens, you get both the bar that bends anteriorly and a bar that bends uh, posteriorly. So what's emerging here is that if you take a gill and its gill arch, a fin and a limb, there are profound similarities, and I've just covered a few of them, in the toolkit and signaling systems that pattern them. That when we look at a you know, phylogenetically relevant set of samples, what we see is they're elements of the same, uh, same genes, same signaling systems, and same functional effects in each of these, in each of these appendages, from the AER uh, to the ZPA. The question then becomes is, what does this tell us about morphology? What does this suggest about expeditions targeted to the key, you know, to, to, to key parts uh, of the tree of life? Well, the obvious, the obvious proposal would be that perhaps the, um, that the, the, the developmental mechanisms that pattern appendages originally arose in another outgrowth. Perhaps that outgrowth was a gill arch. Perhaps that outgrowth was some other one we don't know about. The problem is, is when we look at the fossils we have and plot them on a stratigraphic record, we don't know a whole lot. There's a huge gap in our knowledge from basically the Wentlock of the Silurian all the way through uh, the Middle Ordovician. We would predict from a knowledge of development that there should be out non-limb outgrowths present in, um, in these jawless fish that are present from the Silurian to Ordovician. The challenge is we really don't know anything about them because no one has ever done targeted collecting of vertebrates to these, uh, to these sites. And in fact, I like to think that if uh, in 40 years, there will be people, you know, the graduate students who are in the back, as Eric Lander was saying, who are doing genomic research. I'd like to think that there are a number of graduate students who will found ordovician of vertebrates uh, that tell us something about the, uh, the outgrowths that are, uh, that are likely primitive to, to, to fins. So really, that's what we're doing at our next set of expeditions, are actually to move much deeper in time to begin to look at these nodes here, which are very poorly understood uh, in the fossil record. And armed with our knowledge of development, we are expecting an enormous number of non-limb outgrowths uh, to, be, to be established. There is some comfort to be had here. In a work by Philippe Janvier in 2008, where he described a little tiny jawless fish, Euphanerops, which is this uh, schmoo up here. But when he showed it in detail in his paper, it is very clear that this thing has little gill rays, a jawless fish with gill rays. Uh, we've only known them as sharks before. So this is suggestive evidence that perhaps early jawless fish did have this. But our goal in terms of the expeditions we're going to lead is to see whether this kind of pattern is actually present all the way through the basal portions of the tree of life in the common ancestor of all uh, jawed uh, vertebrates. I mean, all vertebrate. So basically what I want to say is that we can use the fossil record to make targeted expeditions and to make targeted discoveries. In, uh, in key nodes in the history of life. Those fossil discoveries give us new ways to think about the anatomy and the development of extant creatures. And the more we study and, and extant creatures, the more we have ways of reinterpreting uh, the, the, kinds of the kinds of morphologies that may have existed uh, in the distant past. This is a wonderful reciprocal illumination between different areas, sort of different approaches to understanding the history of life. And the only way that they are united is through the profound power of descent with modification and the tree of life that's resulted from it. Thank you very much. But we do, what we do know, though, is that, um, so when you look at what we, what we can infer, is that paired appendages are relatively recent. Unpaired appendages, particularly a median fin, is present first. And then what we're likely proposing here, what we're proposing here is likely here, is that the gills and gill, gill rays are actually the original, uh, the original uh, system that established this. Yes? Where is the expedition? Yeah, so, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, much to my family's dismay, it's up in the Arctic. 
Um, there is an enormous amount of Silurian and Ordovician in the Canadian Arctic, which I've flown over for years, actually flying over it, looking northern Baffin Island, Somerset Island, Cornwallis Island. Um, so I've looked at it, I never realized I'd be actually proposing to work there. Um, it's very well exposed, it's near shore marine, and it's never been worked by anybody. Quite a bit, yeah. Well, very, I mean, it, they have scary similarities to some of this. So versions of the same genes are doing sort of analogous things. And so if you look at a hedgehogs and what they're doing in there, if you compare some of the genes, one gene called DPP compared to BMP4 and vertebrates, um, there are stunning parallels that are analogous in many ways. The real question is, does this extend deep down to arthropods? You know, and it may well be that what's happening is here is the information is being carried along uh, in either outgrowths or some other organs that we, you know, need, uh, that we, um, uh, that, uh, are, that use these signaling systems. Um, the vertebrate pattern seen both in the gill arches and in the limb is different in a lot of ways. I mean, it has some uniqueness to it. What we're actually taking is another approach, which I didn't talk about, is there should be a regulatory signal to this as well in terms of the tissue specific specificity of the cis-regulatory elements that are, some of them that are behind this as well. So um, that's another way of approaching. Okay, well, thank you very much. I will introduce.